to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ much more then, having been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Welcome to our study of power in the blood. Christians often sing, there is power in the blood. And oh, how true it is that without the blood of Jesus, we would have no hope. As we study today about the power of Christ's blood, Let's realize that the sight of blood does affect each of us differently. For example, if there were a puddle of blood and you saw that, some might affect it, be affected differently. Some might become faint and pass out. Others might feel sick and become nauseous. Due to the desensitization that we see on TV and video games today, some might even be entertained by the sight of blood. Some would be reminded of war. Those who had served in war and had seen bloody battles and what happened at the hands of ungodly people would be reminded of war. Others might be reminded of death, maybe the death of a family member, maybe a tragedy that occurred to a friend. When we see blood, it does affect each of us differently, but when we talk about the blood of Christ, let's realize that blood has a very important role in Christianity. For example, in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, back in the Old Covenant and the long ago, God said, life is in the blood. Now, there's a medical fact there, and that is without blood, there is no life. It is the blood flowing through the body, the blood pumping through the heart, through the veins, the oxygen that we receive at the brain that keeps the life going. But there's a deeper message there. Life is found in the blood, blood of the sacrifices, Leviticus 17, and ultimately in the blood of Christ. I believe one of the most compelling passages in the New Testament about the power in the blood is found in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. Look at the beautiful words recorded here. The scripture says, And according to the law, Almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. What do we learn from this thing? That under the old law, things were purified by blood. And without blood, no blood, no forgiveness. Thus, Jesus says in Matthew 26, 28, as he institutes that Lord, the Lord's Supper and as he passes the fruit of the vine, he says, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus' blood is what brings forgiveness to mankind. Do you remember John 19, 34? As Jesus is on the cross and that soldier takes the sword and pierces the side of Jesus, and forthwith comes blood and water, might remind us of Zechariah 13, verse 1. A fountain for cleansing and for sin would be opened up in Jerusalem. Oh, how that is so reminiscent and prophetic of what happened to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as His blood began to freely flow from Calvary. That fountain was opened up. You know, blood is also significant because in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, we are told that Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. Blood was shed by the Son of God so that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ could come into existence and so that we could be in that body of the saved. So as we think about blood, it is significant, but let's think specifically about the power in the blood for Christians today. Number one, Christians are a blood-bought people. Notice again the words of Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. The scripture says, Paul speaking to the elders in Ephesus, therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock 
among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I am a blood-bought Christian. The blood of Jesus paid the ultimate price so that I could be a part of the body of Christ. Well, whose blood was it? The blood of Jesus. God himself sent his son, came in the flesh. You shall call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1 verse 19 following. God's son left heaven. Philippians 2 verse 5. Became obedient to death, even the point of death. Philippians or the cross. Philippians 2 verses 6 through 9. He gave up everything so that we could have the hope of eternal life. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor that we through his poverty might be made rich. Well, how did that blood buy us back? Jesus became the perfect sinless sacrifice and made propitiation for my sins and for yours. He was tempted at all points as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4 verse 15. He committed no sin, nor was guile or deceit found in his mouth. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours alone, for the sins of the whole world. And let's sum that idea up with 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. God made Christ, he made him, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf that we might be the righteousness of God in him. And so it's the blood of Jesus that bought us back. He did that in his perfect sinless sacrifice but when is it that he bought us back? When Jesus hung in agony and suffered at Golgotha and on Calvary and paid the ultimate price in dying, Jesus on the cross bought us back to the Father. 1 Peter 2.24 records it this way. He himself bore our sins in his own body upon the tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. Remember Isaiah 53? Verses 3 through 6, He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. When I think about what it means to be blood-bought, I think about the great sacrifice that Jesus made. Think about it clearly for just a minute. God Himself came in human form to this earth and suffered and died for His own creation. When Jesus was mocked, when he was beaten, when people spit in the face of Jesus, when they took that whip, that cat of nine tails, and brought it across his back, when he hung in agony and struggled for every breath on the cross, and when Jesus said, it is finished, that is when Jesus brought us back to the Father. Oh, how much power there is in the blood of Christ to buy us back to God himself. Well, the blood of Christ is also powerful because it is by Christ's blood that we're redeemed, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Colossians chapter 1, verse 14, and Ephesians chapter 1, and verse 7. As Peter thought about that great sacrifice and the redemption that occurs in Jesus, he said these words by inspiration. Peter said, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. He says, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. What is it that redeemed us? It's the precious blood of Christ. Now, what is the idea of redeemed carry? The term redeemed was also often used of slaves. Uh, at the 50th year, a 50th, the uh, slaves could be bought back. They could be redeemed to, from their master and could go free if someone would pay the price. Well, like a slave, we're also redeemed. Romans 6 verses 17 through 19 tells us whom we present ourselves slaves to. We're that one slaves, whether of sin or of righteousness. Well, at one time, all of us have been enslaved to sin. Romans 3 verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. I have been enslaved to sin, I have been held captive by Satan, and we talk about the precious blood of Jesus redeeming us. It freed me from that captivity. I've been redeemed from condemnation. If I really got 
And if you really got what you deserved, each one of us would go to hell. Psalm 103, verse 10, The Lord has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. If I got what I deserved and you got what you deserved, we'd be lost. But I have been redeemed. I've been freed from that condemnation. Paul exults in Romans 8, verse 1, There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. If we believe and are baptized, we'll be saved. If we don't believe, people will be condemned. And I've been redeemed to serve God. God be thanked that though you were the slaves of sin, yet you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And we've been set free from sin to become slaves or servants of righteousness. Romans 6, verses 18 and 19. I'm here now to serve God. Mark 10, verse 45, Jesus said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. He's my example, 1 Peter 2, 22, And thus, if I've been redeemed by the power in the blood, I must be redeemed to do something, and that is to serve God in this life. Another reason the blood of Christ is so powerful is because Christians are actually cleansed by the blood. As you think about cleansing, you wouldn't think that that red liquid substance, blood, would actually clean. In fact, if you spill it on something, it gets on your clothes, you cut yourself and it gets on you, it doesn't cleanse, it stains. When we talk about blood, although it's represented by the red fluid substance, we're talking more than just the blood itself. We're going deeper to the sacrifice. The blood of Christ is oftentimes used metaphorically for the sacrifice that Jesus made. How does blood cleanse? We're not take something red and clean something out, but it's that sacrifice, that pure and perfect and whole sacrifice that makes it clean. You see, Christians are washed in the blood. I want you to think about the words of Revelation chapter 1 and notice what John records in verse 5. The scripture says, And from Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood. We're not cleansed by, cleansed by the sprinkling of the blood of hesher, heifer, or goats, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without spot or blemish. As John saw Jesus approaching, he said, Behold, that Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When we think of the blood of Jesus cleansing, it's as Isaiah 1 verse 18 says, Though your sins be scarlet, God said, I'll make them white as snow. Though they be crimson, I'll make them like wool. By that great and pure sacrifice, Jesus gives us purity, gives us cleansing. Now friend, if I truly understand and if you truly understand that cleansing comes by the blood of Jesus and we're washed in that blood and we contact that washing in Acts 22, 16 at the point of baptism, Saul was told, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on them, Lord. If the blood of Jesus washes us and that washing occurs at baptism, Acts 22, 16, how we ought to tell others about the blood of Jesus. You don't come in contact with the blood just by believing. You don't come in contact with the blood just by thinking you're going to receive God's grace. You've got to access the blood of Jesus in baptism. Remember Romans 6, 1 through 4? We're buried with him in baptism, at which point we contact his death. If the death and the blood of Jesus saves, and if I contact them at baptism, I'm not saved a moment before I obey God's teaching concerning baptism. Well, Christians are also forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Romans 3 verse 25 clearly teaches that we're justified by His blood. Romans 5 verse 9, we're saved by wrath from the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the shedding of blood that the power is. There's no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. And it wasn't the blood of bulls and goats. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. And yet Jesus in Hebrews 13, 12 made that perfect sacrifice for each and every person. Notice again what Jesus says in Matthew 26 in verse 28. For this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many 
for the remission of sins. When we think about how Christians are forgiven by the blood, as Jesus took that element, the fruit of the vine, which represents his blood, he said, this is what my blood does. It's for the forgiveness of sins. And so we think about the beauty and the wonder of God's forgiveness. God is ready to forgive. Psalm 86 verses 3 through 5. God doesn't want anyone to be lost and go to hell. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. So much so that his own son paid the price, tasted death for every man. Hebrews 2 verses 9 and 10. And I think how beautiful it is that the God of heaven against whom I've sinned, against whom I've committed wrong, is willing to forgive me. If anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. The Hebrews writer said in Hebrews 8 verse 12, that God would be merciful to their sins and their lawless deeds he'd remember no more. Isn't it wonderful to know that the, the sins I've committed, the things I've done against God, the things I've done against others that I have repented and been forgiven of, I don't have to worry about those anymore. All our sins are cast into the depths of the sea. Micah 7 verses 18 and 19. It's as though as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Psalm 103 verses 11 and 12. But let's not forget the great price of forgiveness. Forgiveness comes at a high cost to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus had to leave heaven, come to this earth, be born of a woman, live a perfect life, go about doing good and preaching the gospel, and ultimately pay that price on Calvary. My friends, when Jesus suffered, He paid the most horrible and yet the most wonderful price you could ever imagine. Sin had taken man captive. It was the blood of Jesus and the price on Calvary that made it possible. And friend, that forgiveness should not come cheap to any of us. It ought to demand. It ought to demand of my life and demand of your life that we not take advantage of the sacrifice of Jesus. Let's not put him again to an open shame. Hebrews 10, verse 26 following. Let's not say to ourselves, well, that blood has been offered, the sacrifice has been made, and I can do these things and... I'll ask for forgiveness later. Forgiveness demands that we take sin as seriously as God takes sin. So much so that He was serious enough to send His Son. That He wants us to abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. He wants us to hate sin as God hates it, to run from evil and to cling to that which is good. Romans 12 verses 12 through 19. God expects me and He expects you, based on the price of forgiveness and the demands of it, to live a holy and blameless life. Now, I'm not saying, we're not trying to say, any of us are going to be perfect, but we ought to try for that. Matthew 5, verse 48, be holy or be perfect as He who called you is perfect. In all your conduct, be holy. 1 Peter 1, verse 15. Hebrews 12, verses 12 through 14 says, we are to make sure that without holiness, no one We'll see God. Now, in the rest of our remaining time, as we think about how does one contact the blood of Jesus, let's think seriously about, I want to get in the blood. I know I'm lost. I know I haven't lived the way I should. I know there's sin that needs to be remedied. How do I contact? How do I get into and come in contact with the blood of Jesus? And as always, we're not concerned with what men say. We're not concerned with what's popular and what people may be doing today. We're concerned with two questions. Jeremiah 37 verse 17 asks, Is there any word from the Lord? And in the book of Romans chapter 4 and 5, Paul said, What does the Scripture say? That's what we're concerned with. What does God say? How does the God of heaven, who sent His Son, whose Son paid that ultimate price, what does He say? I must do to contact the blood. Now remember, according to Revelation 1 verse 5, we are washed in the blood. Imagine you have this individual and his life is riddled with sin. 
He's stained with it, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. It's dirtied up his beautiful garments that were created by God, Isaiah 64, verse 6. It's as red, red as crimson, as dark as you can imagine, and black. It's that cancer that eats up one's life, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And so you've got this individual. His life is riddled with sin. He's as black as the sin that is in him. And then he wants to be washed in the blood of Jesus. Where does that transformation from the darkness and the blackness and the filthiness of sin, where does it come from? Where does it occur at? Remember Saul's life? If there were ever a life that was riddled with sin, it was Paul. Now he thought he was doing right. Acts 23 verse 1 teaches us that. But Saul's there holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen. He's wreaking havoc. He's tearing apart the church, it looks like. In Acts chapter 8, he's dragging men and women to prison. Acts chapter 8 and 9. He's headed to do that on the road to Damascus. But the Lord comes to Saul. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And he says, Lord, what would you have me to do? And that transformation begins to take place. Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. Go in the city. It'll be told you what you must do. Now, Saul, Saul still got sin in his life. He's there praying, but he hasn't been washed yet. But he's about to be. Ananias comes to Saul. And in Acts 22, 16, this man who has sin in his life, whose sin is as black and dark as you can imagine, is told, Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If it's the blood of Jesus that washes us, and if that washing occurs at the point of baptism, that man whose life is black and riddled with sin, whose, whose life is full of sin, is cleansed and made whole and white in the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ only at the point of baptism. Now let's think about a second passage that helps us to understand exactly when a person contacts the blood of Jesus. Listen to the words of Romans chapter 6, and I want you to notice verses 1 through 4. The Apostle Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. And then he's going to talk about the process of conversion. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, watch this, were baptized into his death. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Here again, you have got a picture of conversion. You've got a man who's dead. He's a walking corpse, if we can use that terminology, full of sin. And yet he's transformed. How does that happen? It happens based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and our following God's commands. God says, just as Jesus died on the cross. Remember John chapter 19, verse 34? The soldier pierces the side of Jesus, and forthwith come blood and water. Just as Jesus died on the cross, we've got to die to sin. That's repentance. We die to sin, as Jesus said, Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. But then you'll notice in Romans 6, verses 2 and 3, that not only do we die to sin, we're buried with Christ. That man who now has died to a life of sin is placed in a grave. And that grave is not an earthen grave. That grave is the watery grave of baptism. And so his life is beginning to transform. He dies and he's now buried with Christ in baptism. Now notice, he's buried with Christ. If salvation is in Christ, if I've got to contact the death of Christ to become a child of God, at what point do I contact Christ's death? I'm buried with Christ in baptism into death and notice, then that man who has now contacted the death and the blood of Jesus, just like Jesus was raised, is raised out of that watery grave. And he now walks in newness of life. What a beautiful picture of a transformation. He was dead in sin. He's now died to that sin. He's buried with Christ in baptism. And he arises. When? At the point of baptism, he arises out of that water to walk in in newness of life. What a beautiful picture of the transformation that takes place. 
And then I want you to notice Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. The scripture says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now think about it. If salvation is in Christ... 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. If it's the blood of Jesus that saves, Hebrews 9, 22, and if all spiritual blessings are in Christ, then we naturally have to ask, how does a person get in Christ? How do we contact that blood? Remember again the words of Galatians 3, 27? As many of us as were baptized into Christ. That is how there's power in the blood. Oh, the sacrifice has been made. And the sacrifice is, is amply able, is more than able to save us from sin. But if a sacrifice lies out there for you and you don't contact it, if you don't access it, it won't do anybody any good. I've got to access the sacrifice of Jesus by getting up and doing what God says. Now, here's what we mean. You've got to hear the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 teaches faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Once I've heard that message, the power is in the blood and Jesus saves, I've got to believe it. Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. John 8, 24. Then I've got to change my life. Remember that death that must occur? I've got to repent and turn again. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Then I've got to make the good confession just as the Ethiopian eunuch did. I've got to confess Jesus is the Christ the Son of the living God, Acts chapter 8 and verse 37. And yes, you must, you cannot contact the power that's in the blood without being baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. Now, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not the source. I'm not the authority. That's what Jesus says. Mark 16, verse 16, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Friend, if Jesus said, belief and baptism save, why would we ever say anything different? Do you see today the great power that's in the blood of Christ? Have you accessed that power? Have you contacted the blood of Jesus? If not, friend, we kindly and lovingly say to you, you're still lost and you're dead in sin, but the good news is, you can contact the power in the blood. Won't you obey the gospel? Won't you become a Christian so you can have that power in your life through the gospel of Christ? You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.